Want to give a shout out to John Riley's Tuesday virtual group, as well as Jack Perry's Wednesday virtual group and Waterford Lakes Wednesday morning virtual and live group. So Forge is uh, is growing, and we're good to have you guys with us. We're so glad you're here. Now I understand that Lieutenant Dawson Cowan is here. Is he here? Hey, stand up for us now. Let's give it up. Thank you for your work. Good to see you again. Pretty soon, you're going to be Captain Doctor, and uh, we're proud of you and thankful for you, and we will salute you at the proper time. Good to have you with us here today. Well, listen, guys, you know that Forge is about building great men who build great men as God defines greatness, and we're doing this all to the glory of God. You guys are super important, and let me pray. I'll introduce our speaker for today. Let's pray. Father, what a joy it is to come into your presence today and to be with men who are following you in every walk of life. Thank you that we get to serve you. Thank you that you called us as your deeply beloved sons. Jesus, thank you that you did everything uh, to bring us into a relationship with the Father. We commit our time this morning and so thankful for our special speaker today. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Well, if you're involved in sports in Orlando, uh, everybody knows the name Pat Williams, and uh, it's a privilege to have Pat Williams here today. Let me just tell you a couple of things. Pat is a, a basketball Hall of Famer, of course, uh, the co-founder uh, of the Orlando Magic here in town. Uh, his sports uh, vitae is just long and deep and rich, uh, and uh, I just saw his library that he donated to First Baptist Church. It is uh, it is tens of thousands of books, but he himself is the author of a hundred books, a hundred books, uh, and uh, Pat's latest book that I read recently is Revolutionary Leadership. Uh, it's absolutely fantastic, and uh, so he, his his sports world goes before him. He's going to talk some about that, talk about leadership this morning. But it's important that we understand that uh, Pat's been through it as well. He, in 2011, fought, Luke, fought uh, cancer, multiple myeloma, and 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 that's deadly. And it's he, he doesn't have it in his body anymore, so he's obviously been protected and healed. Let me tell you, Pat and his wife are the parents of night. Figure these numbers. You ready? Sports is all about numbers, right? 19 children, 14 adopted from four different nations. Pat has been blessed with 17 grandchildren. Uh, he is also the author uh, of the foreword to our first Forge book, uh, written by John Allenson, Relentless Sales. And I, the best thing about, about Pat is that he is a committed follower of Jesus Christ. He's in a Sunday school class at First Baptist Church. Let's... Welcome, Pat Williams. Thank you, Pat. Come on. Good to have you. Good to have you. <clears throat> well, I'm Pat Williams, and I was invited uh, by Pete, uh, uh, except he told me it was at 7 p.m. <laughs> and uh, I asked him the size of this room. He said, yeah, it sleeps about 170. <laughs> and I told Pete, I'm, I'm great fun to listen to at this hour of the day if you like to yawn. <laughs> you know, gang, everything rises and falls on leadership. It always has. It always will. And it's always going to be a topic of intense discussion in our country. So I want to welcome you this morning uh, to the leadership conference. And you say to me, well, what if I'm not a leader? Now, let me check that out. Uh, how many uh, husbands are here today? Just put your hands up. Uh, welcome to the leadership conference. You're definitely leaders. Any grandparents here? Oh, my goodness. Well, I'm a grandparent 21 times over, and uh, you're all leaders. Uh, any businesses that you're involved in and helping to run? 
Uh, just put your hand up. Yeah, you're part of the leadership group. Uh, volunteer at your church. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, boy. We got a room full of leaders, Pete. This is unbelievable. Anybody involved with youth sports in the community? Yeah, we got that. I mean, every hand's gone up. So uh, you're all leaders. Welcome. I became fascinated with this topic when I moved to Orlando. Well, it was 37 years ago. And Orlando was really beginning to develop as a convention city, a conference city, uh, with Vegas and other cities really beginning to boom. And we'd gotten the basketball team off to the start. And then in 1992, you know, we got that wonderful break that led to the drafting of Shaquille O'Neal. And a year later, uh, that led again to the arrival of Penny Hardaway. And suddenly, your Orlando magic were a hot item. And I began to get uh, these requests to speak to different conferences that were coming here. And I, I, I liked that. It was pretty cool. Except here's the story. Uh, as I had pre-calls uh, on this whole issue, uh, you know what most of these companies and corporations and conventions wanted to talk on? Leadership. And I'd been in leadership positions, really, uh, since junior high school. I was a quarterback in football and a catcher in baseball. And so I'd, I'd, I'd played the leadership positions. And all the way through, I, I was in leadership roles. But to talk about it and, and come up with something really intelligent. So I was forced to do some deep, quick research which still goes on to this day. And I began to examine the world's greatest leaders. And I was looking to see if there were common traits, common threads uh, that, that these great leaders, these men and women, uh, had jointly, no matter what period of time they lived in. And I was particularly concerned with how do you take those principles from the greatest leaders and apply them to, to our life. How do I incorporate them as a leader? And, and how do I pass that on? So that's been a, a great passion of mine for lo these many decades, and, and it still is. And, and here's what I discovered. After all that examination and all that reading and all that interviewing and all that exploring, I uh, came away convinced and, and solid that there were seven key principles that every great leader from the beginning of time, every great leader possessed. Seven key principles. And I want to share them with you today. And I want to tell you in advance uh, that uh, as you look at this and begin to examine your own life as a leader, uh, all seven of these principles must be there if you're going to be a complete leader. If one of them is missing or really weak, uh, that's going to be a, a, a gaping hole in your leadership arsenal. Second thought in advance here. You can take these seven principles and apply them immediately, like this morning. You don't have to wait or some opening of the heavens, or some direct voice from above, you can put these into practice immediately. So uh, I'm ready to share them with you, if you all are ready. I, I see we've got uh, a little flyer to write on. That's great. Uh, do we all have pens and pencils? If there were women here, I'd ask, do you have lipstick or mascara? And, and, and you guys are all basically too old uh, to have those little computer things, you know, that the young people use. It, it's nice that you've, you know what I'm talking about. It, it's nice just to have paper and a pen. Now, leadership has become a big business. 
in this country. There are books pouring out on leadership every week. I don't know where the authors come from, but they are just writing leadership. You can, you can go to college today and major in leadership. You can get a doctorate in it. it, it it's remarkable. And I often wonder, how did the great leaders of the past lead if there were no books? How, how did George Washington lead if there were no, no seminars to go to? Uh, Abraham Lincoln? I mean, did he take courses? Uh, it's amazing, but today, boy, it's all coming. And these leadership gurus do not agree on everything. However, on the first ingredient of leadership excellence, they're in accord, no quarrels. And, and here, here's this first principle. It's one word, it simply is the word <clears throat> vision. Vision, visionary leaders. Well, visionary leaders <clears throat> see before others. They see farther down the road than others. They see in uh, vivid technicolor, uh, while the rest of us might see it in grainy black and white. Uh, leadership who are visionaries, well, uh, they're special. They're special. I, I believe here in Orlando that we live in the visionary capital of the world. L let me tell you what I mean. In 1963, February 22nd, a California businessman took a clandestine mission in a private airplane over this neck of the woods. Actually, the first place he looked was Ocala, because he had grown up there and spent time as a kid there. But Walt Disney went on that little private plane, and he looked down, and all he saw out over that area were swamps and marshy bogland and open fields, and uh, woods, oh, it, it was nothing. But he wanted a place east of the Mississippi. And so he said, that's where we're going to build it, right there in that place of woods and nothing. But he had a vision. He had a big vision. And then right after that, here comes Arnold Palmer. And Arnold had big visions of turning Orlando into the golf capital of the world. <clears throat> that was a big vision that happened. And then we had an astronaut by the name of John Young from Orlando, and he had a big vision of going to the moon. And he did that. And now they've named a whole highway after him. I guess that's what happens when you go to the moon. And then an educator came to town. His name was John Hitt. And John Hitt became the president of this little commuter school out on the east side of Orlando. And his, uh, his vision, well, let me tell you about the end result of his vision. UCF is now the second largest university in the country <clears throat> with no end in sight. It just keeps going. And really, the vision of this one educator, the greatest leaders are visionaries. Uh, George Washington, for example, uh, during the uh, eight years of the Revolutionary War, what was his vision? <clears throat> A new nation independent of Great Britain's rule. That's what kept him going. And during the five years that Abraham Lincoln in, was in the White House, uh, what was his prime vision? One nation, not two, which could have led, by the way, to five or six or eight 
I mean, we could have ended up like Europe. Uh, we'd be speaking eight different languages across America. Uh, but Mr. Lincoln had a vision of one nation. And on it goes, the greatest leaders are visionaries. Martin Luther King's vision. A nation where we would not be judged by the color of our skin, but by the content of our character. But you know who the greatest visionary leader was of history? Jesus Christ. Uh, follow me on this. Uh, and you can really dive into it later on today. Uh, John chapter 14, uh, first verse. He, he's speaking to his disciples, and he says these words. <clears throat> Let not your heart be troubled. By the way, Sean Hannity did not say that first. <laughs> He stole it from Jesus. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, many dwelling places. Although I like the idea of a mansion. That's pretty cool. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, and I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place, I will receive you unto myself, so that where I am, you may be also. And then, of course, he added in the sixth verse, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Boy, that's a vision if there ever was one. A vision of an eternal home, an eternal life, and Jesus is going to be there. And uh, the disciples were confused. I, I think I would have been too. But we know now that's where we're headed. If we know Jesus, that's the ticket. What a vision. What a vision. So leaders, <clears throat> it all starts with a vision as leaders. And that's a good question for us this morning. What is your vision? Young people, what vision do you have for your life? What vision do you have for your future? What do you want to be doing 20 years from now? What has God really implanted in your heart? Uh, why are you on this earth? What's the purpose for your life? Well, I'll tell you one quick little insight. When your greatest talent intersects with your greatest passion, you have found the sweet spot in your life. And that's where you want to stay. That's where you want to get educated. That's where you want to get paid every two weeks. That's where you want to keep working until you're 94 years old and, and never feel like you've worked a day in your life when your greatest talent intersects with your greatest passion, uh, you found your sweet spot. And that's the vision I think that God has for your life. Now there's a second key here on this whole leadership discussion. <clears throat> it's one thing to have a vision, but leaders, uh, if we don't communicate it well, uh, let me tell you what's going to happen to that vision. Nothing. Nada. Nicked. Not one thing's going to happen to that vision. So how do you communicate a vision? How do you do it? Well, I'm going to share with you the, the, the C's, the letter C of communication. And, and feel free uh, down the road. I mean, it, it, you may come up with more than I've got. The seas of communication. And see if Jesus didn't do this as, as we read about him in the four Gospels. Be clear. Be concise. 
Be correct. Be consistent. Be confident. Be calm. Be compassionate. Cursing? No. <laughs> Nobody likes a cussing leader. And here's one other that hits me. Be courageous. There are times when a leader has to speak with courage. And, and, and throughout the, those four Gospels, Jesus would do that, particularly uh, when he went after the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He, uh, he didn't really like them. And uh, he, he thought they were stuffed shirts. He thought they were phonies. And boy, he would uh, he'd go after them. And there are times I'm thinking, Jesus, maybe, maybe, maybe you should back off a little bit here. Uh, but uh, when he felt it was important to speak out, speak up, he did it with courage. So you'd be thinking about some other C's. I, 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 I probably didn't hit them all. But you know the, what the best leaders best communicating leaders, you know what they do? They have really developed the skill of speaking effectively in front of other people. Oh, they've gotten good at it. And uh, you see, leadership generally gravitates <clears throat> to the man or woman who can talk. Uh, that's generally who we elect to office. Uh, that's generally who gets the CEO post or the high school principal job. That, that's generally what happens. So I, uh, I encourage leaders across the board uh, really take seriously this whole issue of communicating in front of other people. Uh, study the great leaders of history. Uh, here, here's another thought. Um, join Toastmasters. Join the National Speakers Association. Uh, take that, uh, that Dale Carnegie speech course. Uh, you know who took that course years ago? No. Warren Buffett out in Omaha, Nebraska. And if we, excuse me, gang, and if we could slip into his office today in Omaha, let me tell you, we wouldn't see a lot of stuff on his walls. Uh, wouldn't see a lot of plaques. Wouldn't see a lot of trophies. Uh, but we would see one frame certificate. It's from that Dale Carnegie course he took. Cost him 100 bucks said the best hundred dollars I ever spent uh, because it changed my life as a leader. <clears throat> One other thought on this whole issue of uh, communicating as a leader, <clears throat> save your stories. We are hardwired to retain stories, not PowerPoints, thank goodness. We love stories, and, and the best leaders, as you study them, were marvelous storytellers. Uh, Jesus, in his day, well, they were called parables, uh, but he, he just loved to tell stories, and uh, that's why we enjoy reading them. They, 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 had a, they had a purpose, they had a mission, and, and uh, later on, we had Abraham Lincoln in his yarns, and we had uh, John F. Kennedy in his quips, and we had the great communicator, Ronald Reagan, 
and told his stories, some of which had actually happened. <laughs> Sometimes Mr. Reagan got confused about movie parts. <clears throat> and, uh, <laughs> but we loved them. Communicating leaders. Oh, and by the way, when you've got some time, uh, turn to Matthew chapter 5, 6 and 7. This was Jesus for the really first time out on the big stage. And he was communicating a whole new way of life. Oh, I, I, I hope somebody taped it. And it's out in a cave somewhere in the Middle East. And someday a little shepherd boy is going to come across it. Oh, wouldn't that be something? We'll, we'll get to hear it when we get to heaven. Uh, but in the meantime, the best we can do is, is just read it and imagine Jesus in this public setting uh, in those three chapters of the book of Matthew. So we've established uh, leaders that, uh, first of all, it starts with vision. And secondly, communicating your vision is so vital. Here's the third piece I can share with you about leadership excellence. <clears throat> it's called people skills. Great leaders have people skills. And what does that mean? Well, great leaders are interested in other people. Great leaders uh, have a heart for people. Great leaders are fascinated with people. Uh, <laughs> great leaders just have a concern for others. Uh, you know what I'm trying to say. Uh, the best leaders love people. They love people. Dick Vermeil uh, coached the Eagles for years when I was in Philly, <clears throat> and he became a friend. He was quite a guy, still is, still beloved in Philadelphia. And I heard Dick say one day, <clears throat> I tell my assistant coaches I love them. He said, why should you feel something and not say it? That left an imprint on me. Uh, if you've got a heart for people and you care about them, tell them you love them. So, so what are people skills? Uh, what are some people skills that uh, we could really be working on? Well, here's one that comes to mind. <clears throat> be visible and available to your people. Be visible and available. There's a tendency I've noticed in leadership as you begin to move up the ranks, get further up into that ivory tower, uh, there's a tendency to kind of seal yourself off, uh, kind, of, kind of just stay up there and nobody can get at you. Uh, but the best leaders are visible and available. Tom Peters called it managing by walking around. But listen, long before Tom Peters came along, uh, Jesus was putting that into action. You see, his ministry lasted just a thousand days, three years, that was it. And uh, his schedule had to be packed, had to be really tight. His handlers had to be on top of every minute of every day because time was, time was vital. I mean, to, to take a look at his Franklin planner <laughs> or his day timer, I'm not sure which one he used, but it had to be absolutely jammed. But inevitably, uh, Jesus would uh, get it bungled up uh, because he'd run into a lady at a well. Or he'd run, in, run into a lady with a bleeding issue. Or he'd run into a little guy in a pool of water who couldn't move, you know, and he just was there at the shallow end. <sighs> or, or maybe a tax collector up in a tree 
<laughs> who then said, Jesus, come over to my house and hang out with me for like three days. <laughs> now the, the handlers had to be out of their mind. But, but there he was, visible and available. That, that's what the best leaders do, visible and available. Now, by the way, in the eight years of the Revolutionary War, uh, do you realize George Washington never left his troops? Never got back home uh, to the farm. That's where his heart was. Uh, never left the troops. Visible and available. Here's a second people skill. It's simply called listening. <clears throat> listening leaders. They're actually kind of rare. Uh, we've got a lot of talking leaders. But when a listening leader comes along, you know, that man or woman will never be forgotten. And Jesus was a listening leader. He listened to people. He could really just bore in on them. And, and you know what? I think it's the greatest compliment you can pay anybody uh, to, uh, to listen to them. I mean, you're really paying them a great compliment. And in the process, by the way, you can learn something, particularly in your organization. Uh, people want that organization to do well. And they've got a lot of good ideas. And, and when a boss listens to them, man, you're paying a, a great tribute to that person. But you know what else Jesus was really good at? The best, asking questions of people. And they were, they were direct questions. Uh, in, in the four Gospels, he asks 306 questions. 306 questions. I mean, I know some people that haven't asked 306 questions in their life. Um, he, he knew how to draw people out. And, and when you study his questions, they were all basically uh, one-sentence questions. That's how to draw people out. Um, what do you think about this? Or how would you make the call on this one? Or... Um, what brought you to Orlando 30 years ago? What do you think Orlando is going to be like in 30 years? I mean, one sentence questions to draw people out and stimulate conversation. And it's the best way, I think, to really get into somebody's soul and, and, and see uh, what their spiritual temperature is. Uh, how, how about this question? D do you think... There's life after this one? That's it. Do you think there's life after? I ask that, people, that question a lot. Uh, do you think there's life after this one? And generally it's, uh, well, I, I, I'm not sure. What do you think? Oh, you talk about an open door. <laughs> so here's where we are. Leadership starts with vision, always. The ability to communicate that vision is vital. People skills sets leaders apart. Here's a fourth ingredient I want to share with you. Uh, character counts in leadership. Character still counts in leadership. Character will always count in leadership. Or will it? You know, there's, there's a debate out there. One school of thought says, if the polls are good, if the economy is good, well, the character stuff is not all that important. The other argument says you can't lead without character. Uh, do you remember uh, General Schwarzkopf? Stormin' Norman. He once said this. He said, uh, leadership consists of two vital ingredients. He said, strategy and character. 
And then he said, if you have to do without one, he said, uh, do without the strategy. Character, I think you can only go as high on the leadership ladder as your character will allow you. So what are the character qualities of, of unique leaders, special leaders? It's pretty basic. I'm going to give them to you. Honesty, telling the truth in every situation. Number two, integrity. Integrity comes from the root word integer, which means one, which would lead to a word like integrated, one society. Ken Whitten is a pastor over in Tampa. And uh, for many years, uh, Tony Dungy, the coach, uh, sat under his ministry. And uh, Ken Whitten once said to me, here's the deal with Tony Dungy. He said, the tongue in his mouth is always pointing in the same direction as the tongue in his shoes. He said, his walk and talk match. There, there's no difference. There's a third uh, character quality <clears throat> of, of character leaders. It's called responsibility. Uh, character leaders take responsibility. Uh, they're not finger pointers. Uh, they're not blame merchants. Uh, their, their, their approach is simply this. Uh, this was done well and we, we did it. Uh, this was done poorly, and I did it. Uh, but they don't blame. They're not, uh, they're not pointing fingers all the time. And, and a fourth character quality, let me just share it with you. <clears throat> it's called humility. A humble spirit. Boy, it's a beautiful quality, isn't it? When you run into somebody of note or somebody you've admired from afar, and you see that, uh, that they have a beautiful, humble spirit. Mm, mm, mm. Well, you walk away just feeling great. If, on the other hand, you find that person to be pompous, arrogant, full of themselves, oh, that's a big disappointment. And think about this with me for a minute. Jesus... Uh, who, who was around at the beginning of the world. And God chose him to come down to this earth in human form and spend 33 years on this earth. You realize uh, Jesus could have been the most impossible person ever to walk the face of this earth. He was God. I mean, he was God. And he was down among us, down among people. And yet... The Bible keeps talking about his, his humble spirit. Boy, I, I, I have a hard time getting my arms around that, that, that he modeled humility for us. When he, when, he, when he created us, when he created, helped create the world, it's just overwhelming. Well, we've arrived at the fifth principle here that I want to share with you. It is called competence. Competence. What does that mean? Well, here's, I think, what it means. Leaders are good at what they do. And that begs the question, how did they get good? Born or made? Oh, I, I get asked that question a lot. Are leaders born or made? And my answer is always the same. Both. Every leader that I have ever examined or every leader I've ever studied at some point in time was born. <laughs> every one of them including Jesus. And every leader at some point in time was developed. 
And you know, I think there's a pattern here on how leaders uh, get started. Uh, and let me just give you an example. Uh, the Little League Baseball program in town isn't really running well. And uh, this committee comes to you and says, we, we need somebody new to take this thing over. And, and, and we all agree that, that you're the one, you're the man, you're the, per, you're the person. And, and you say, oh, I'm, I, I'm just so busy. I'm, I'm too busy. I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to help, but uh, I'll, I'll go, go get somebody else and I'll, I'll, I'll chip in. But let's ring a bell. And, uh, but they keep coming at you. And they won't let up. And finally, to get them off your neck, you say, oh, all right, all right. And so now you're, you, you put your neck in the noose. And you don't want to have the whole thing just collapse or under your direction. You, you know, so now you, you gather some people around you, and little by little, you get a little more enthused, and you begin to have some meetings, and you get there, and, and the season's underway, and everything's running beautifully, and you're getting more and more into it. And, and at the end of the year, all the accolades are just pouring in. Man, you were so, did such a great job, and this was so beautifully run, and we're so proud of you. And, and you're thinking, can't wait till next year. Didn't have much time on this one, but next year it's going to be even better. <clears throat> the leadership bug has bitten you, <clears throat> and you never want to go back. You never want to just bop along with the troops anymore. You kind of like being out in front, being a leader. So what are some competencies of the best leaders? A few quick thoughts. Number one, solving problems. Colin Powell put it this way. He said, when soldiers stop bringing you their problems, uh, you're through as a leader. Uh, they either consider that you don't care or you're too busy for them, but uh, that, that was his observation. Anybody can lead in the good times, but when the problems hit, we find out who the good leaders are. Secondly, great leaders have the competency of selling. Oh, they can sell. I think Jesus was the greatest salesman in the history of the world to come down from heaven with this new, whole new outlook on life and a whole message about how to have eternal life. And he, and he, and he sold this in, in a limited way for those three years. I mean, it's unbelievable what he did in that period. He could sell. And, and to be a great leader, we're always selling. We never stop selling. Third competency. Spotting good talent, spotting talent, and then developing it into a team. That's what great coaches do. Uh, they can recognize talent, and then they know how to mesh it together into a team, and, 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 and everybody has the right role. Uh, they're, they're proficient at that. So Jesus handpicked these 12 disciples. <clears throat> I'm not sure any of them were superstars. I don't think any of them were. They all had their strengths. And somehow he took these 12 people, including one bad apple, and he merged them together into a pretty good team, don't you think? I mean, they had the responsibility uh, 2,000 years ago of spreading the word about this new way to go through life and into the next one. Uh, that was their job to spread it. And uh, we're still at it today. Uh, that team did, did pretty well. And, and here's one other competency. It's the competency to teach. The best leaders really are great teachers. In fact, they love to teach. 
Vince Lombardi years ago said they call it coaching, but it's really teaching. And as I read in the New Testament, I really believe that Jesus enjoyed teaching. Uh, he, he really enjoyed it. Loved to see the reaction of people. He was a teacher at heart. Uh, but you know, <clears throat> we can't be great teachers until we make a commitment to be lifelong learners. John F. Kennedy said, learning and leadership are indispensable to each other. So how do we become lifelong learners? Three quick thoughts. Number one, continue your formal education, young people, and old people as well. Maybe you're thinking, you know, I never got my master's. Well, you can do it. You, you don't have to go to school. You don't have to go to the campus. You just do it at home. Or how about at this point in your life, you're saying, I don't have enough to do. I think I'm just going to go get my doctorate. Well, just do it. You can do it. You don't have to go up to Gainesville or Tallahassee. You don't have to go over to, out to UCF. Just get it done. Continue your formal education. Secondly, hang with the smartest people you can find. And, and I don't care how old we are, we never, never outgrow our need for mentors. I don't care whether you call them mentors or life coaches or, or, or sages, I like that word. Uh, we need them in our life. We don't need 20 of them, but we need three or four. And, and, and you're never too old to have mentors, never. And third way to be a lifelong learner, Be a lifelong reader of good books. Harry Truman years ago said, uh, not all readers will be leaders, but all leaders must be readers of good books. So there's a challenge, men. Uh, do you realize that 80% uh, of all the books purchased in America today are purchased by women? Uh, men basically are non-readers. And the end result is our brains are not fully developed. Uh, I mean, reading is what exercises this muscle. Now, you attach a book to it, it it's going to give it a good workout every day. So I, I, I didn't bring all 135 books today that I've written, but I brought two of them, and that'll get you started. Uh, And we still have library cards. And you can still go to the Winter Park Library or the Orlando Library and go up on that third floor, wherever it is, and, and they, they, they sell books, like for a dollar. I mean, they're, they're not current, but they, they're good, good quality books. You buy a book for a buck or two. And uh, get into reading. Well, we've now arrived at the sixth point. And it's simply called boldness. Not baldness, sir. It's called boldness. And here's what that means. At some point, the best leaders have to decide what to do. I can still hear George W's voice in the White House. I'm the decider. <clears throat> I decide what to do. <clears throat> I decide what's right. <clears throat> Napoleon put it this way, talking about leadership. He said the greatest uh, talent or the greatest gift that any leader has is the ability to decide. Boldness in leadership. The organizations that don't have good deciders just kind of spin around. They just kind of float and drift. Never really get anywhere. Uh, those are the organizations 
uh, that have a philosophy of ready, aim, 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 aim. <laughs> Some point you got to fire. And now, boy, I'm running tight here, Pete. I mean, I was told that it, uh, at five minutes of, everybody gets up and leaves. <laughs> But before you get up and leave, would you like to hear the seventh ingredient? Yes, I can't hear you. Yes. Na, 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 na. <laughs> I told you they weren't going to leave, Pete. <clears throat> the seventh ingredient of leadership excellence is simply called a serving heart. A serving heart, a serving heart mentality. Here's the mindset of a serving hearted leader. It's not about me, <clears throat> it's always about you. It's not about my personal success, it's about your success and the success of this organization. It's not about advancing my career goals, it's about advancing yours. That, that's how a serving-hearted leader thinks. And of course, Jesus modeled for us in, uh, in powerful fashion uh, his last night with the disciples. He, he wanted to share with them in, in, in a vivid way what it meant to have a serving-hearted mentality. So he dismissed the servants Got a bucket of water, towel, insisted that the disciples take their sandals off. And that was not a pretty scene. Listen, they didn't have paved rows back then. And they weren't wearing Nikes or Skechers. And uh, they, they didn't know about manis and petties. <laughs> There's only one way to describe those feet. <clears throat> they were gnarly. And yet Jesus insisted that he was going to clean them. He was going to put them in the water and clean them and towel them off. Whew. Boy, that had to be a powerful scene. And, and really what he was doing was simply modeling for us how to be a serving-hearted leader. At one point he said, uh, you want to be great? You want to be number one? You, you, you want to just sort at the top? Well, you go out and serve people. That's how to do it. That's how to do it. So let me, uh, let me tie this all together. And, and I hope we can spend a little time together back in the, in the book room. I'll be happy to stay and uh, visit with you and sign books. If you want to do some photos, we'll do them as well. But let me just tie together what we've learned here. Seven things one must do to be a leader, right and true. Have vision that is strong and clear. Communicate so they can hear. Have people's skills based in love and character that's far above. The competence to solve and teach and boldness that has fearless reach. A serving heart that stands close by to help, assist, and edify. God bless you.
Well, gentlemen, what you got today was a magnum opus, a life, a life well lived, a life well studied, and a lesson, I know, right? I took notes. You'll hear it again. Pat, I'll give you credit once, uh, and then it's mine. Uh, but uh, I hope we all take these things and apply them to our life. I'm so glad you're here. If you're with us for the first time, there are too many names for me to remember. I'm sorry, uh, but we're glad you're here. Come back. Pat's going to be in the back, uh, and he's got two books available to us. Every Day is Game Day, a 365-day devotional, uh, holding great teams together. Two, it's a bundle, 625 bucks a piece. So it's, it's uh, 30 bucks if you want to get them back then. He's back there. He'll talk. And uh, I, what a privilege to imbibe this and apply this to our lives. Let's pray, and then you can go uh, greet Pat on the way out. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the fact that you build great men and you take us deep in our lives and you make us great for your glory and for the good of other people. And I pray that this message would go deep into our hearts here at Forge and that you would continue to use us as we lead, as we work, as we advance your kingdom. We commit the truth that we gained here today. And Lord Jesus, thank you that you model it perfectly. We honor you. Be with my brothers as we head out there today. We pray in your strong and holy name, Lord Jesus, and all God's men said, amen. amen. Thanks for being here today, guys.